look inside the black box, right? So it's a famous movie. They do it very well in the airline industry. You can figure out everything, right? So if we can figure that out, we know a lot more about the brain. I do have to acknowledge a lot of people helping me with the research, and also here I've had funding from uh, one of the manufacturers of the brain oxygen monitor. So just as a way of background, since we're in Rome, yes. right, Monere to warn, right, that's where monitoring is derived from. And, and it's interesting when you talk about hypoxia, and this was something I thought that at medical school was drilled into us, that blue color of cyanosis was a given, but it's not a very reliable means of detecting hypoxia. And really only in the 1980s and 90s, mainly from studies in anesthesia, was it demonstrated that you need something more than clinical means, and once you have those monitors, you're able to figure out how often hypoxia occurs. I do leave this slide at the bottom, or this line at the bottom, no matter what monitor you got, and we're all talking about monitoring today, ultimately it's us monitoring the monitors that will make a difference, because it's our interpretation all that information. Although perhaps when we talk about informatics, we might start going into decision analysis and decision support that could override the human brain and its limitations. So we focus mainly on intracranial pressure, and I just put that up as, a, as an introduction because the way we've approached it very traditionally is in this stair-step approach. And we do that not because we know what to do, but because we think that's the least deleterious and that's the most deleterious. So we choose our therapies based on potentially less risk. I think that's all going to get thrown on its head when Randy Chestnut's data from Bolivia comes out because the patients in the ICP monitor group have the same outcome as those without. And what he's really going to say is that we don't know how to treat ICP. <laughs> Just leave that open for you to think about it before that data comes out. Having said that, there is some analysis that suggests when you interpret the ICP information, you might get a better outcome. This is a meta-analysis from 120,000 patients suggesting that as you follow guidelines, you get better outcome. But be warned, there are two studies, and, and Olaf Kremer is here today, and he was one of the first to demonstrate that just by treating ICP, you may not make a difference. It perhaps is when you treat it and how you treat it that's more important and simply treating it. And when we've looked at our own data in subarachnoid hemorrhage, you'll find that the vast majority of patients who do badly have very high ICP, but there's a significant group here that still do well. And this actually spoke to compliance and elastance within the system, not simply the ICP number alone. So when you look at intracranial pressure, I think it remains the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of other pathophysiologic entities that occur and our primary focus has been looking at the cellular level to try and understand cellular health. I always equate ICP and CPP, if you're a Keynesian economic, with the supply side, all right? Now, your business will fail if you've got a great product that you can supply, but nobody wants to buy it. So you have to have demand. Now, demand doesn't simply mean understanding what's being used. It's all that how do you get it out of the blood vessel, through the endothelium, through the micro vasculature, talking about capillary density and diffusion capability and so on. So that concept of multimodality monitoring becomes important. And here we use brain oxygen and you'll see it's not used in isolation. And I think that's another important tenant perhaps of any monitoring. There's no one single monitor that's valuable. It's how you use many monitors and interpret them that becomes valuable. You'll see as a Swan-Gans catheter in place, so this is a patient from several years ago, but he's got microdialysis and Lycox and continuous EEG and so on going on. So multimodality monitoring, I think, is defined as the simultaneous collection of data from diverse sources from a single entity because you need these complementary tools to be able to interpret what's going on. And why do we need that in the brain? Well, the brain is very, very complex. You can divide it up if you want into hemodynamic, metabolic, and electrical subsystems, and there's more to it than that. We have a lot of physiologic data, and our ability to interpret that is fairly limited. So if you walk up to a patient in the neurocritical care unit, at any one point in time, there's at least 200 variables that you can interpret if you take their physical exam and demographics and CT. The average human brain, which means probably all of us in this room can only interrelate two variables at one time. 
So we need some assistance. So we need the computerized informatics to help us. And this, if we get overloaded, will lead to problems. But the real value in monitoring more than ICP is early detection. You know, one of the, again, the philosophies of, of stroke management is widen the therapeutic window. Well, this is continuous EEG, and you'll see this change in alpha variability here 12 hours before the clinical exam changes in anterior cerebral artery stroke. When you look at it from a biochemical standpoint, this is microdialysis changes occurring 12 to 14 hours before ICP goes up. So this then allows us to get beyond this very empiric medical treatment, which is what we do for ICP. We don't understand the mechanisms behind ICP. We choose our therapies because they're phenomenological. Because the ICP went down, we say we should use it. But we don't quite understand the reason why the ICP went up or down. So we need to get down here to more targeted therapy and perhaps individualized medicine, and our colleagues in cancer are doing that far better than us. So what do I want to know in the ICU? Well, I still want to know about ICP and flow. I'd like to understand metabolism. And on the back end, I want to see the function, which might be SACP and EEG or perhaps some biomarkers. That's what we can do now. I'm not talking about what I'd like in the, in the future. So, so why oxygen? I don't remember this other than the, this little thing at the bottom, which I alluded to earlier about when you've got glucose and oxygen, you get 30 ATP. In the absence of oxygen, you get 2 ATP. So oxygen is in great demand for the brain. It's about 2% of the body mass, takes up about 20% of the oxygen. And so your oxygen metabolism is about 3.5 mils per 100 grams per minute. Most all of that is aerobic. The oxygen extraction is about 35%. So there's a compensatory reserve built in. What is going to influence oxygen? And Nino already alluded to that, talking about the length and diameter of the perfused capillaries, the number of perfused capillaries, oxygen diffusion, and so on. If we take our current monitoring tools in the ICU, and we don't have anything that looks at oxygenation, we really understand the systemic factors that are going to influence brain oxygen. This might be the supply side of whatever you're trying to sell. So your arterial blood pressure, your blood hemoglobin, hemoglobin oxygenation dissociation. But at that point, there's the endothelium. We don't know what's going from the endothelium to the mitochondria. So we don't know how the oxygen is being released from hemoglobin, how it's diffusing through plasma across the endothelium and so on. So is there a rationale to measure brain oxygen? Taking different studies. Again, the group from Cambridge using PET suggested that most of the cellular hypoxia was diffusion-related rather than perfusion. So you wouldn't pick it up with a CPP abnormality. Ross Bullock and Tony Marmaru looked at uh, MRI and said most of the edema is cellular in origin. So again, you wouldn't be able to understand oxygen diffusion unless you were looking at something beyond CPP. Paul Vesper and the group at UCLA have also demonstrated that this increase in lactate pyruvate ratio may increase when there still is a normal CPP in periconfusional tissues. We used AVDO2 and found that in patients who had a high ICP, which was corrected either through surgery or mannitol, still patients could have an infarct, and that infarct was associated with a failure of the AVDO2 to improve. So you're no longer getting adequate oxygen extraction. So oxygen might be measured in a variety of ways in the ICU, PET, MRS, jugular catheters, partial pressure of oxygen, and nerves. I'm really going to focus on partial pressure of oxygen, because I think there are other talks on nerves and so on. PET and MRS are really snapshots in time. I think they're valuable research tools. So a very brief word about jugular saturation. I think 10 years ago we used this very commonly. We don't use it as much now in our ICU. I think jugular catheters are actually difficult to use. They open to a lot of finicky manipulation and you're recalibrating them and so on. They can be useful. But interestingly, it requires a very large volume of ischemia in the brain for the SJVO2 to change, way more than you might see in the average head and patients. And these are PET studies that have been done. But the critical value for an SJVO2 is perhaps less than 50, suggesting ischemia. When it's hyperemic, your SJO2 is going to increase. The converse is true for AVDO2, where the AVDO2 will widen, 
perhaps around 8 or 9 volume percent when there's ischemia and narrow when you start to correct for that ischemia. If we look at brain oxygen monitors, and currently the only one commercially available is Lycox, at least in the United States, there might be one or two other places in Europe where you can get neurotrend or paratrend. It's a fairly simple system to use and it's fairly robust. You have this little credit card that you stick in here to calibrate. If you don't use the correct one, you get the wrong answer. So it's a modified Clark electrode, so it does use a little bit of energy. It is temperature dependent. So you need a temperature probe with this to give you the correct oxygen. I don't remember the fancy gas laws that the guys in anesthesia use, but temperature affects partial pressure of oxygen. So there are people who will use a microdialysis catheter, ICP monitor and brain oxygen monitor and give you all this fancy stuff. And I, I won't tell you which institution has done that and done a ton of data. It's all BS in the end because they've never corrected for temperature. You have to remember that. You can, if you don't put a temperature monitor in, and they all combine ICP and temperature probes and combine oxygen and temperature probes. Interestingly, if I show you this, the triple lumen bolt made by the same company, its oxygen temperature probe does not go through that bolt. So you have to use a temperature and ICP probe. It's a little complex. It's all about FDA regulations and so on. You can, if you don't have a temperature probe, manually enter core body temperature onto the machine. It's close, but not quite perfect. An important question is where? It's in the white matter. We've heard the discussion about hemodex. Big question for any invasive monitor, local versus global, right? So here's a study where we try to relate the blood flow to, or cerebral blood flow measured by xenon CT to brain oxygen. I'm going to say up front, a brain oxygen monitor is not a blood flow monitor. But get the slopes here and the slopes in any quadrant, and we did this with gray matter in the same. If the probe is in normal white matter, the slopes are the same. My statisticians tell me through some fancy smoke and guns that it means that that oxygen value there equals that, equals that, equals that. So if you are in normal white matter, then your local monitor is a reasonable estimate of global oxygenation. Having said that, there's the discussion, penumbral or not. Claudia Robinson has just, the paper's actually in review still, suggested that where you place your catheter will determine what the oxygen value means. So your outcome relationship can be dependent on where it is. So obviously if it's in the infarcted tissue, it is often a meaningless value. If it's within the penumbra or a centimeter away, it might be a little different from white matter. These are important considerations. The catheter can be in the wrong place. These are some examples from our shop. This catheter is in the wrong place. It's more in the gray matter. This is an old person and a thickened arachnoid. The catheter is spun out here. This one went through a contusion. The values will be wrong. You might also see influence by pneumocephalus in some patients. So we tend to test the system. We put it in, take an arbitrary time period. You've got to let the capillary settle down. Could it be 30 minutes, an hour, two hours? We look and see if the brain's normal. We assume that that's okay. If it's low, we're going to challenge. There's been a lot of debate about what should be the normal response but we've taken a greater than 5% to a greater than 10 millimeter mercury response. It's almost instantaneous if you induce hyperoxia. You should see an increase in oxygenation. Do remember that hyperoxia itself can cause vasoconstriction, so it can have other effects too. If we do not see a physiologic response, we get a CAT scan and then figure out if anatomically our placement is wrong. So here are the basic values. Somewhere between 25 and 35 is normal. 20, we're going to begin treating. 10 is hypoxia, and 5, the tissue dies. This is the threshold we're using in a, in a current NIH trial is 20. People sometimes say 15. It's somewhere in that area. There is some normative data that suggests above 25 will be within the range of normal. So there's a lot of questions about what we do or don't know. It's a busy slide. I think the important things are what we don't know, right? So the relationship between brain oxygen and the balance between delivery and metabolism is a certain threshold going to ensure adequate oxygenation at the cellular level. What actually determines brain oxygen, how does it relate to venous and arterial oxygen content, 
and as I said before, I don't think it's a blood flow monitor. It might be something else. Is there a means of measuring this non-invasively? How do we react to it? What do we do? This is a study where there's a hemodex probe, a brain oxygen probe, blood pressure probe. You're challenging the system with oxygen, mean arterial pressure, and hyperventilation. You get this curve suggesting that brain oxygen here is blood flow multiplied by the arterial venous difference of oxygen, or the AVTO2. So you're now starting to see something that's going across the cell. It does not necessarily affect cellular use, but it's telling you a little bit about diffusion from artery to vein in addition to flow or perfusion. When you look at this, it starts to make sense. Oxygen's got to be dissolved to be reflected or to get to the cellular level. Neuronal mitochondria need about this much oxygen, 1.5 millimeters of mercury to function. That actually corresponds to a brain oxygen somewhere between 15 and 20. When you look at fancy fluorescence quenching MRI, about the same, 15 plus minus 5. Importantly to remember that your apparent diffusion coefficient of oxygen does not change when there's ischemia. So let's look at some factors that might affect oxygenation in the brain. Not unexpectedly, lung function. So the worse your lung function, he has a PF ratio of less than 300, lower overall oxygenation, more frequent episodes of abnormal tissue oxygenation. Hyperventilation, I think one of the biggest misunderstandings has come about from the guidelines is that we shouldn't use hyperventilation. By the converse, it's a great treatment for raised ICP in select patients. If they go back to Musilar's study, 30 versus 30 versus 30 patients, prophylactic hyperventilation for people who had normal ICP, right? But it can, if used incorrectly, adversely affect oxygenation. So here you wouldn't use it, right? Opposite here, hyperoxia, improving oxygenation. Other ways of getting oxygen in through blood, blood can, one of our studies initially demonstrated this, but 25% you see a decrease in oxygenation. So again, blood can be good, blood can be bad. That's a, a common theme with some of our therapies. It might have to do with the age of the blood, nitric oxide content, 2,3-DPG content, and so on. What is important when you start to look at the relationship between hemoglobin and oxygenation, um, it is a lot more frequent that when hemoglobin is less than 9, you start to see hypoxia. And importantly, in traumatic brain injury, when you have anemia, it's often not so bad. It's anemia and brain tissue hypoxia. So some of the, what we've been looking at, both traumatic brain injury and subarachnoid hemorrhage, the concept of a threshold hemoglobin of 7, I think is fairly meaningless when you start to look at the brain. We should be looking beyond the hemoglobin at end organ sufficiency, which is maybe one measure of that is oxygenation. What about flow or perfusion? Well, the primary goals in the TBI guidelines are to get your CPP to this ever-moving target right now. I'm not even sure where it is, but let's say greater than 60. 95% of the time, we can do that in our patients in about six hours at our institutions, the level one trauma center. But you'll see here about 30% of patients still have evidence for hypoxia or compromised oxygenation. Perhaps that speaks to the ABCDE of resuscitation, where D and E are delivery and extraction, going a little bit beyond just simply airway breathing and circulation. We have not found a relationship between ICP and PBO2 when you look at individual patients, right? There might be a relationship in that ICP will go up and brain oxygen will go down. We've also seen ICP go up and brain oxygen go up. But as an overall correlation, there isn't. So you cannot use ICP or perfusion pressure to predict oxygenation. Temperature may affect it, not unexpectedly. It's the shivering, so your VO2 max has gone up. You see that reduction in oxygenation. Obese patients tend to have a lower brain oxygenation. I'm not quite sure of the reason. We thought this was all lung function related, and it might well be. Nice to know that sometimes what we do surgically makes a difference. So a decompressive craniectomy here has significantly reduced the burden of hypoxia. And despite the DECRA trial, I still think this is valuable in the select patients. And again, I'm not going to get into the DECRA trial. There's some many, many issues with it about why I don't think it, uh, it necessarily reflects what we do. Importantly, transport can affect patients. We all know that in a way that it can be difficult to transport patients. 
Here we've seen an adverse effect on oxygenation of the brain, particularly when they start off with a low brain oxygen. And again, this seems to be lung function related based on how you're ventilating the patients and so on. Patients of an older age tend to have less of a response to pressors. We've seen a lower oxygenation in that group. We've seen effects through nemotapine and other drugs that you might not expect. These are often weight related. And it's an important reminder to us is that we tend in the ICU to give a standard dose. So nemotapine was 60 milligrams per kilogram. Well, it used to be said that the average person in the United States was 70 kilograms in a male. Now 70 kilograms is pretty small. I mean, you've got these really <laughs> obese 300-pound, 400-pound people. Uh, you know, a 400-pound 20-year-old male is very different from an 80-pound 80 80-year-old 80 woman. If you think about what we do in the lab, it's all micrograms per milligram. We dose and titrate according to body weight and gender, and it might be something that we need to do more frequently in our patients. Does knowing all this physiology make a difference? I am not a fan of meta-analysis. I think it's a little bit of statistical trickery, but we did a systematic review and did find from observational data that when you have a low brain oxygen, the chances of mortality and unfavorable outcome were significantly increased as an independent factor associated with outcome. Importantly, it was not simply a marker of disease severity. So here's 100 patients from, from our series. What we did find was the Marshall CT score, so speaking to the anatomic injury, the Apache score speaking to the physiologic consequences of injury, and tissue burden, so rather brain tissue hypoxia burden, an area under the curve analysis were all independent factors associated with the outcome, and intracranial hypertension fell out of the model. Importantly, we found long-term neurocognitive effects are associated with it. So it's not simply a mortality division or GOS outcome. Now this is starting to look more in cognitive function. And the guidelines talk about a threshold of 15. That's all. This is the severe TBI guidelines. They really don't talk about a lot more. And here I think they misunderstood the point. It's not about ischemia. It doesn't look for ischemia. It can tell you if there may be ischemia, but it's not an ischemia monitor. So the obvious question is, can you use this to guide therapy? And any therapy needs to be biologically plausible. I won't go through this in detail other than to say there's enough clinical and experimental and physiologic data to say perhaps it is biologically plausible. And there might be a mechanism. And that mechanism is if you injure a mouse, here's the sham mouse, given normal ventilation, normobaric hyperoxia or hyperbaric hyperoxia, you restore ATP levels. And a lot of the injury side is mitochondrial driven in the sense of lack of ATP. So there is perhaps value to that oxygenation. There's no magic single management. This is just good ICU care. So you are tweaking the system. So I don't know if anybody does long distance sailing and you have a short wave radio. You kind of use the course thing, you get a little bit of information, and you have the fine tuner. This is the fine tuner to that information. It has a paradigm, won't go through that in detail. The different therapies, and you'll see that there's this consistency of about three quarters respond to therapy. We tend, when we use these patients, to tolerate higher ICPs. And more frequently, elevated ICP, we also tend to tolerate lower CPP. So now you're starting to target your therapy there does seem to be an outcome difference, and this is in our own series, and it is related in part to the burden of hypoxia, and also whether, and this is a busy side, whether they respond to therapy or not. So when you pull the data, and unfortunately all of this is retrospective or historical controls with zone biases, but you pull the data with brain oxygen-based therapy added to ICP and CP-based therapy, you improve outcome by twofold. It's clinical equipoise because this one doesn't work. So we don't have any level one evidence that it works. But then who uses level one evidence anyway? We all base our therapies on, on physiology. There's a phase two trial that's ongoing now to try and answer that question. It's very difficult to mimic in a trial what we do in the ICU. But that is the, the goal of that trial. I leave you with that thought, though, that it's what we do with the information that becomes important. Thank you.